Hello and welcome to this webinar looking at the value of local and the continued rise in importance of food provenance for hospitality venues. My name is Katie Moses. I'm MD and founder of CAM, a research agency specialising in hospitality. And I'm going to start by sharing some of our latest consumer research into what is driving venue and food choice and how that's changing with this increased focus on local and the value that it presents to both operators and consumers. Then I will be handing over to Sophie Cahoon, uh, who runs the insights department for the Welsh government. Um, and she will talk about Welsh products, uh, the value that they have, and use Wales as a bit of a case study as to where local and provenance could go from here. Next up, we will have a panel discussion, and I will be joined by Kate Nichols, CEO of UK Hospitality, Joby Mortimer, Corporate Account Director for Hospitality and Breaks, and Simon Wright, who currently runs and owns Wright's Independent Food Emporium, and is also a founder of the Welsh Independent Restaurant Collective. So let's start by talking about why are we talking about local I'm going to show you some insight that tells you that consumers are increasingly demanding it um, and that consumers are increasingly valuing it. The planet needs it. Um, and we also know that local can drive footfall, it can drive loyalty, it can drive spend, and it does have a bit of a halo effect um, over the products that we are uh, putting out there for consumers. And also we mustn't forget that local can actually help us to tackle some of the issues that we have at the moment um, in the supply chain. So very, very, very briefly, and anyone that's seen me present before will know this slide, but I think this is a really good summary of where we are um, post lockdowns um, and including the unfortunate cost of living crisis that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, these are three trends that we have seen appear and that we don't see are going away anytime soon. So the first one being that idea that there's been a bit of a deregulation of life. We know that people are living a bit more digitally. We know that people are eating earlier. We know that people are going to bed earlier. Um, we know that the going out nights are shifting a little bit towards Tuesday and Thursday. And we know that people are staying closer to home. And some recent insight by CGA shows us that actually during that pandemic, um, people are definitely eating more within their locality. So that comes on to the local lives idea, the idea that there is more of a reliance on and a support for local businesses and community. We've seen that shift in home working patterns. Um, those people who said, well, it'll never take off, where everybody will be back in the office. We know that hasn't fully happened. We know that some have gone back, um, but certainly there still has been a shift. And that increased desire to support local and independent businesses is still there, maybe not as much as it was during the pandemic, but we are seeing that um, as an existing trend and something that I believe is going to, to regrow um, due to the needs of consumers and obviously what local businesses are putting out there. In the first three months of lockdown, there was the average spelt the average household spent four. K, okay, £4,000 on nesting, on making their home environment better. So whether that was getting new sofas, whether that was having a nice outdoor area. So our houses are essentially just nicer places to be now. And then finally, the healthy me, healthy world. Health has been catapulted up the agenda, not just physical, but also the idea of a healthy mind, a healthy body, a healthy planet. Um, and that gives us an increase in purpose-driven brands. And of course, locality just fits um, really well with that trend. Okay, let's talk local and independent and food-led venues. So this is from a piece of research we conducted in May 2022, where we asked UK adults, where are you expecting to visit more, less or the same in the coming year? And you'll see there that the winners are very clear. The local and community pubs, the 38% that are looking to increase their visits to food-led pubs and 33% to independent pubs. So that all just feeds into that idea of being local, being independent um, and, and, and being led by that idea of staying closer to home. And obviously, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the idea that adults will uh, be staying more local to save money on fuel uh, will also play into this idea of local. And what do customers want to see more of? Again, this is from the return of the pub in May 2022. So it's a recent piece of research. We asked, do you think that venues should be offering more 
or less of the following food types? Or do you think that maybe they've got it right? And you'll see there that overwhelmingly 47% want more locally sourced items, 34% more sustainable menu items. So again, this trend for local, this trend for sustainable, uh, all of that is playing into exactly what consumers are asking for from their pubs, their bars, their restaurants, and of course, other leisure venues as well. Um, and operators have actually started to adapt their offer and nothing gives me more joy than seeing a piece of research where the consumer wants something and the operator understands that they want that and starts to provide it for them. 34% um, of the operators we spoke to as part of that research program said that they were um, looking for that they were they were stocking more locally sourced items and 16% more sustainable menu items. So it's great to see there that the operators are listening to what their customers, what their consumers want and are beginning to deliver that. What we also must remember is that engaging Generation Z um, in pubs specifically, but also in, in all different leisure outlets is incredibly important. You know, they think, um, they act and they behave very differently to generations gone before them. And actually they are much more interested in things like the impact of, of a brand on their health, the impact of a brand on their environment, their ethical stance, their charity work, their political stance. All of these things are very important to Gen Z. They believe that brands out there, whether that's producers, suppliers, operators, need to be actually living their values and that they need to be doing things that are good for the environment, for the world, for, for, for people in general, for their consumers. So for Gen Z, this idea of locality, this idea of sustainable menu items, all of that is, is incredibly important. Um, Gen Zs also value that path to plate or path to path to glass um, much more and importantly they want to be told about it so this is from a wine decisions white paper we released earlier this year you'll see there in blue that's the total of gen z's who tell us the percentage is important when choosing wine to order so 61 percent think it's important to know it's sustainable 57 percent organic biodynamic vegan you can read the charts there yourself um the important bit here for me is that they would actually like to see these credentials on menus. So 61% of Gen Z have said, yes, don't just do it, but tell me about it. Gen Z actually want to understand what is out there, what's being put in their glasses and on their plates. Coming on to the food menu, then, that is an incredibly important part um, of selling locality and sustainability and provenance um, to consumers. So when we ask consumers what they look for when they are researching potential pubs, bars, restaurants to visit, and this is part of our plan to plate report, 54% said what's on the food menu. So we know that there is already that interest there to look at the food menu, to understand uh, what, what's on offer and, and where it's come from. Then we ask them what will be the factors that influence your choice of food when ordering in pubs, bars and restaurants and food provenance and seasonal produce, 12% uh, and 11%. That may sound low, but believe me, that is increasing um, massively year on year whenever we ask this, this sort of type of question. And you've got descriptions on the menu there at 33%. So we really do need to make sure that we are shouting about local and about provenance and about sustainability, because it really does have an effect on the choices that people are making when they come into our venues. And you can see here, the top 10 points that if we flagged against uh, dishes on a menu, so you know, what are the top 10 things that if we said that this dish does X, Y, and Z, what would that what would encourage customers to order labeled as locally sourced comes forth their special offer we would always expect that to be there today or this week's special we know that that's a, a good um, green flag for consumers healthier option that is increasing in importance but then number four is labeled as locally sourced so we know that actually it's what consumers are looking for and it will make a difference to what they order when they see a menu we also know that we can actually upsell and upgrade through locality. We know that 44% of customers that we spoke to as part of our return of the pub program said, yes, staff had uh, had tried to upsell to us. And 55% of customers said that the staff upsell worked. So it's really important here to think about 
are we engaging and um, encouraging staff members, team members to upsell through locality? Do you know that this is a, a, a local product? Do you know that this has come from a local farm? Do you know that this has a provenance that we can trace right back, you know, farm to fork situation? We know that that is going to help um, consumers, customers to, to make a choice. We also know that local and sustainable items can provide price tiering. Um, and this is an example we have from, from, again, from Return of the Pub. We know that people may well be drinking less, but they are drinking better. They may well be eating out less, but they, they, they are eating better. When given a hypothetical scenario where we offered customers the opportunity to have two premium gin and tonics or three standard gin and tonics, you can see there who went for the premium versus the standard. And if we use the idea that local sustainable provenance adds value to the products that we're selling, then we know that in the case of a premium versus standard, that the preference is probably going to be towards that two premium gin and tonics, especially there for the older generation. And of course, we've already captured the younger generation, the Gen Zs, by talking about provenance and talking about local, which is already very important to them. So in summary, why should we be looking at local and why does it work? Well, it's important within our community. It gives a point of difference to the um, to the venues and the operators that that, that serve it. Um, the menu is incredibly important. It's a sales document. We need to be putting local and provenance and sustainability on that menu. And then also locality and provenance just gives us that opportunity to premiumize um, uh, and, and to upsell and to upgrade customers without us necessarily um, changing, ma making massive changes to the menu, but instead just offering that fantastic offer of local of provenance of sustainability, which we do so well in the UK. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for watching. I'm now gonna hand over to Sophie Cahoon that manages the Welsh Government's Food and Drink Insight Programme. She's going to share a case study with you of what she's seen, the value of Welshness and how it benefits operators and consumers alike and how actually if it's replicated throughout the UK, it could be incredibly valuable both to operators and also keep customers and consumers very happy. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much, Katie. That was really insightful. Um, I'm going to talk about the value of Welshness outside of the home. Um, this is part of a series of work we've done over the last four years, just understanding of the value of Welshness within Wales and actually outside of Wales. Um, but I think it's, as Casey says, a really sort of um, great example of localness or how that could be replicated across GB. So um, it should be very useful, I think, in understanding localness as a concept. So the value of Welshness, I'm going to talk about three things, really. I'm going to talk about the importance of Welsh in Wales. I'm going to talk about how Welshness adds value in Wales from a commercial perspective. And I've got a couple of examples from, of about that. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is the relevance of Welsh food and drink outside of Wales. But to start off with, let's look at um, guest avail or the availability of Welsh uh, food and drink within Wales and guest perception of that. When you ask guests, you know, how much Welsh food and drink is available, they say that they only find about 45% of venues are offering a fair amount of Welsh food and drink. So not very much, only 45%, less than half. And even if you look at restaurants and gastro pubs, it's still about half, which still seems not very much in, in, in my view. And then if you ask guests whether they think that's important to offer Welsh food and drink, then nine out of 10 guests say it's important that venues offer a good range of dishes with Welsh ingredients. Eight out of 10 guests think it's important that venues have a good range of Welsh drinks. And then when we asked in our business survey, how important do businesses think that Welsh food and drinks should be made available? Only two thirds of them said that it was actually important. For me, this is really quite um, quite important because it shows what I call the guest need gap, the difference between what guests want to have and potentially what businesses are providing. And there's a significant guest need gap between what business uh, guests would like and what businesses are providing. And the second thing I suppose that's quite interesting is, you know, why do people think it's important? Why do people think it's important that Welsh ingredients and uh, used in dishes and Welsh drinks are sold? And if you ask guests, then, then in Wales, it's all about three things. They talk about local, supporting local, supporting the economy, supporting farmer. They talk about freshness. 
They think local is freshness or Welsh in this case is more is, is fresher. And they also talk about it being better for the environment, closer to where it's produced, so shorter supply chains. If you ask visitors who come to Wales what, what the most three most important things about having Welsh on the range is, again, they talk about supporting the local economy because they just want to do that. They also talk about freshness. But the thing that really struck me is this whole thing about experience. They say it enhances my experience. And as we know, in hospitality, experience is really everything. It drives trial and loyalty and everything else that goes with it. So adding Welshness, or in this case, or maybe localness across GB, really can add to the experience of a, of an, um, for the guest and makes a significant difference. And then, of course, you ask them, you know, would you like more Welsh? Then 80% say, yes, please. Um, what about the commercial benefits? Well, you ask people whether or not they'll pay more for Welsh in Wales, and 50% said they'll pay more for a Welsh dish. And four out of 10 will say they pay more for a Welsh drink. And what I think is important about this is it's not about the whole range. It's about offering a choice. It's about offering guests a choice when they come into venue so that you can potentially drive trade up. And there's a premiumization opportunity here for people to spend a little bit more for something that's a bit more special, a bit better, a bit like when Katie was describing the gin and tonic um, research that they've done with CAM. And then I suppose the big thing that I, other big sort of gap that I think is here is the whole thing about promotion. So if you ask people, you know, should you be promoting, should you be promoting Welshness uh, in venue or wherever, nine out of 10 people say, yes, if, you've, if you're doing Welsh, tell us about it. Tell us about, uh, tell us about the Welshness that you're doing. And if you ask guests whether they've seen any, seven out of 10 said they'd seen some, 44% of businesses claim to highlight any Welsh. And when we did a survey of 70 different outlets across, the, uh, across Wales, top trip advisor outlets across Wales, only 14%, one in seven actually advertised Welsh food and drink on the menu. And that for me, and we already talked about this, 54% of people look at the menu as a way of seeing where their advertisements are and where they're understanding what's there. And yet we're really not telling them about it. So there's a massive promotion gap here in the same way that there is a potentially a range gap as well. And the last thing that I think is really interesting from a commercial perspective is, you know, does it drive trial and loyalty? And from, um, if you ask guests, you know, are you more likely to visit if there's a decent Welsh range? And three quarters of guests say, yes, actually it's a real drive for me to come and try the outlet, a real great way of driving trial. And if you ask guests, if there's no Welsh, what Welsh range, will, are you less likely to visit? A quarter of guests say yes. So is there a loyalty effect here? So if you're not stocking Welsh in Wales, potentially over time, are you going to lose loyalty? Um, one of the things I want to share with you briefly is a piece of, from retail. And the reason I've shown retail is because it's really clear on the numbers and really clear in terms of the commercial, uh, commercial benefit. And the example I want to share with you is Asda. Whilst the photograph is terrible, and I apologise for that, it just shows Peter's Pies, which is a pretty well-known brand in Wales of pies and savoury pastry. You can see it's got two whole mods, as they're called, two whole stacks of shelves of just Peter's Pies in this Asda, in Asda stores across Wales. And the chart on the right shows the commercial benefit. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that Asda Wales massively overtrades on their performance in all the pie category, pies and picnics versus in GB, they actually under trade versus their fair share, fair share. So what it really shows is that by giving what, in this case, shoppers intent to buy Welshness, putting in the right environment, that changes shopper behavior, and that actually generates additional commercial sales from this case for Asda. Um, and then the same case, we can look at the same thing for this case, Breck on Carrick, which is a water brand in Wales, in Tesco. Again, you can see large amounts of the fixture uh, donated um, to Breck on Carrick. And yet again, in Tesco, they overtrade in, in water in Wales versus the overtrade in, in GB. They're doing significantly better. Um, and the result of this, it just shows that if you do get, in this case, localness right, and you put uh, support it with the environment and promotion to actually can lead to additional sales for whoever does that well. So I've talked about Welshness in Wales. What about the relevance of Welshness outside of Wales? Um, and I think the first thing to think about is Wales as a sort of a hospitality destination, if you like, or a visitor destination. Um, it's actually as big as the West Country, as big as Scotland, or even slightly bigger than both those destinations in terms of 
places that people like to go people like to go on holiday and in fact something like 8.4 million people went to wales on holiday in uh, uh, 2019 and if you ask people who travel to wales or visitors who go to wales what they understand about welshness uh, and for english uh, for english guests specifically they talk about naturalness and freshness being at the heart of what welshness is about and they talk about things like sheep, green hills, small farms, rural, not built up, beaches, mountains, windy, rain, windy roads, villages and towns, wet rain, rain, lots of rain. That's why it's so green. And of course, the number one association is lamb. Um, and they talk about it being unspoiled, rural, human scale, artisan, not mega commercial. And then, of course, they talk about their holiday happiness. They talk about the fact that they've had lovely holidays there with their families and friends. And, norm, uh, and we know that these visitors are more likely to be ABC One profile, by the way. And a quarter of them feel partly Welsh. They've got family in Wales. They were brought up in Wales. Uh, they went to school in Wales, any of those things. And as a result of that, Wales feels uh, more emotionally close, more local more local than say Scotland or Ireland. And as a result of that, a lot of the brand values that then get built around Welshness can be translated out. And again, I've got one more example. And again, it's easy to show because it's the data is easily purchased. And the example I want to share with you is MS. MS launched in season lamb in uh, in 2020. They launched West Country at the very beginning of the year, then they launched Welsh lamb across 20 weeks across the summer, and then they finished the year with Scottish lamb. And they did it really well. They put great in-store signage, great promotions. And the result of this change in terms of dialing up provenance, talking about localness, meant that MS sales grew by 37, uh, 36% versus the market at minus 7%. So massive growth in proportion to the market just by using localness and provenance, and in this case, Welsh, to really drive sales. Um, so I just want to finish with really four key points. Uh, one is, in Wales, guests believe that stocking Welsh is really important, um, but there is a business get perception gap, uh, gap, and there is a real need gap that we feel that can, can be addressed. Um, addressed. The second thing is actually localness or Welshness can really um, give premiumization opportunities because quite a lot of guests will actually trade up. Um, and I suppose the third thing is stocking Welshness in Wales really can enhance both trial and loyalty, loyalty over the long term, because you encourage people to come back and back. And finally, Welsh provenance um, in England and for many guests um, really does can add value because it's felt as artisan, local and relatively close for many people in England. Um, thank you very much. I'm now going to pass back to um, Katie now. Thank you very much, Sophie. That was fantastic. It was really great to understand a little bit more about the value of local and always good to have a case study in there. Now, if you could please welcome my wonderful panelists. I've got Kate Nichols, who is probably needs no introduction, the CEO of UK Hospitality, Joby Mortimer, who's the Corporate Account Director for Hospitality for Breaks, and Simon Wright, who currently owns and runs Wright's Independent Food Emporium and is also a founder of the WIRC. So welcome everybody to talk about the value of local. I have obviously already introduced you all, but Simon, I'd like to just start with you because I'd just like to hear a little bit more um, about uh, Wright's Independent Food Emporium. So if you could just let us know a little bit about you and, and about that, uh, about your emporium, that would be really helpful. And then I'm going to come on to some questions for the rest of the panel. OK, well, we've been uh, we've been running Wright's for 10 years. Um, it's um, a restaurant, but it's also uh, a delicatessen. So we we actually sell retail local food as as well. Um, I've run restaurants in the same area for thirty five years, and um, you know, local produce has always been at the centre of of what we've done. So it's in, as important, if not more important, now than it's ever been. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, that was a great presentation from Sophie on the growing demand for Welsh products. Obviously, that can be um, sort of picked up and put at any particular locality within the UK and that idea that there's a growing demand for it. 
what um what personally resonates with you uh let's let's start with with joby um with regards to that idea of sort of welsh and welsh food and welsh products and and also are there any other areas of the uk that you feel a particular affinity towards the the sort of locality idea yeah um so i think uh, growing up on the border of wales whilst i am english when it comes to rugby I'm definitely uh, very connected to, to all things Welsh. A uh, number of my friends kind of grew up there. I passed my driving test in Wales. So I think when I, when I see all of, all of the, the beautiful things that are Welshness, and if you haven't looked, go and look at Simon's website because you will absolutely be hungry when you look at some of those fantastic images. But, you know, I grew up drink, uh, drinking, eating Welsh oggies when I went to Glastonbury, drinking Glamorgan Brewing Company's Welsh beer as soon as I hit uh, an age of, of being able to drink. And, and like many people, I, uh, I grew up on a small farm and we used to keep badger-faced Welsh sheep. So I used to eat Welsh lamb as well. So for me, when I see all of the, the, the brilliant Welshness things out there, it absolutely kind of resonates with me. But I am English for the rugby. <laughs> Fantastic. Kate? <laughs> That's probably an important distinction to make, yeah, um, although so. I have to say the Welsh ladies rugby team is, is doing the nation proud. Um, I, I think there are some unique special circumstances around Wales and Welshness. I mean, we are talking about a country and we tend to talk about regions in the UK when we're talking about food and drink provenance. And it's probably more of a hyper local issue when you look at, at England. We don't tend to market English food, Scotland and Wales do it brilliantly um, and I do think when you look at Wales Welshness and the importance for Welsh customers domestic and international tourists it's intrinsically built into the, the promotion of the Welsh language and the promotion of the Welsh culture and so I don't think it's necessarily as simple as saying you can take and look at what Wales did and it'll translate over into the West Midlands the southeast uh, you know I think we are more hyper local in, in England. But that said, you know, the Welsh government has put a lot of time, effort, and money into some really significant marketing campaigns, particularly around red meat, not just Welsh lamb, but Welsh beef too. Um, and also to, to link up really care cleverly Welsh food and drink and Welsh exports to Welsh hospitality. So they link it to tourism. They make it one and the same. And this has been a decade long campaign. So well, Sophie's right. It, it, it really translates very well. Um, but I just think those are important caveats. How local is local when you're talking about a whole country? Um, you know, we, we would be very proud of Buxton Water. It doesn't have the same resonance all the way across England as, as uh, Brecon Carrig would across Wales, which is seen as, as Welsh. Um, but but there are there are some areas that we, we can take that across to. Um, and I think, you know, the, the other area that the Welsh government campaign has, has done around tourism and hospitality is to, to have a dedicated marketing board that's about eating the landscape and putting it into that context of, of conservation of the landscape. Um, again, that translates really well in Cumbria, in North Yorkshire, in Northumberland, but we don't tend to see it uh, depicted as such partly because it doesn't have the million pound marketing campaigns behind it that Welsh food and drinkers have to have. The final point that I would make is the distinctiveness that you get in Wales is around a network of SMEs supporting independent businesses. So local in Wales is synonymous with independent. It's synonymous with uh, a local business. And that's an important distinction about the way in which the Welsh food and drink economy works. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I, I think that that the the move towards local, perhaps in some areas of England, has been a lot slower than it has been in Wales because of that that particular network. And Simon, you will be uh, obviously very well aware, probably in the middle of that network, I, I, I would say. Tell me what you're hearing from consumers. You know, obviously, Kate's just you know made a very good point that local exists in Wales anyway as a, as a concept very much so. Have you seen an increase in that concept since the pandemic? Um, and what, what are your consumers, customers saying to you? Yeah, I think we have. I mean, you know, during the pandemic itself, obviously, uh, you know, it was an interesting situation because you know, we didn't experience the same shortages of supply that some people did because obviously our relationships with our producers were very close. 
Um, and so although maybe the fruit and veg producers that, that we use were finding that there was a wider market for their stuff during the pandemic, you know, they would prioritize us and others who'd been their longstanding customers. So um, I think they definitely put a focus on local. And I think it does actually go beyond sort of hospitality and retail. And it's, it, it's about the wider picture as well. I think there's a little bit of a realization out there amongst the public. Um, about the need for food security and the need to actually producing food within the UK for our own consumption. And, you know, anyone who knows a little bit about where we stand with that, we're not in a particularly strong position. So I think that's been part of the picture as well, and particularly in Wales, where there is a, as, as Kate sort of alluded to, there's a strong element of patriotism involved in this as well. And you don't necessarily get that strength of feeling. So I'm sure it's there in, in, in the regions of, of England. So, and I think that has persisted post COVID. I mean, there are a number of challenges to it, obviously, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the pressure on people's purses at the moment. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sometimes uh, the fact that there is a premium to pay for local. Um, but I think, again, there's an increasing understanding that you know, where local is associated with quality, and that's a really important connection to make because it's not enough for stuff to be Welsh. It has to be Welsh and of quality as well. Uh, we can't sell things that are just labeled Welsh because they're Welsh, it wouldn't work because people would have it once and they won't come back for it again. So, you know, that's an important thing to recognize. And, and obviously as well, the, the depth of the base in terms of what's being produced you know, what is the size of our larder? Uh, and that's really important because we can only sell what's being produced as well. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges to that at the moment. And it's very important to work on that relationship with the public, their understanding of why we're buying local, their inclination to do so and the reasons for it. Mm, thank you. Joby, um, building on what Simon has just said, what do you think local means to to your customers as uh, you know as customers of breaks yeah so so for us local is all around the the provenance of, of the product we quite often have some blurred lines that we have to work through where um people mistake local as being buying from a local butcher for instance when that meat might actually come from poland or argentina wherever and actually it's really important to make sure that you really kind of get down to what someone actually means. And for the consumers, we find it always is about the provenance of the product, where it comes from, the traceability. And that's something for us as a, as a big business, we have to work really hard to make sure we can always provide that because that's becoming more important for the consumer. We've seen it in the presentations today. And more and more, the, the next generation of consumers, so the Gen Zs you were talking about, that's what they're expecting. So we need to make sure we educate our customers that when they're talking about buying local, they're understanding it's the provenance of the product, not necessarily where they're buying it from because the food miles could be massively different between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kate, we know how important community engagement is within uh, hospitality. Um, do you think that that sort of benefit of local can help hospitality to you know to to, to keep their customers happy and to, to drive footfall and to drive spend etc because this isn't just about us all being nice and buying from people that have got a farm down the road there needs to be a commercial argument for participating in local and provenance what are your thoughts on that no, I, I think it does. And I think it is about what Joby said. It's about transparency and clarity and provenance for the consumer. That's really what you're, what you're talking about. And that might be in some cases really hyper local. In other cases, it could be that it's just from the UK, it's from England, it's from Wales, it's from Scotland, identifying that. So I think that goes back to my point about how local is local. Really what the customer is saying is I'd like to know a little bit more about what the provenance is of this product. And depending on what you are as an operator, that might be very specific and be very detailed about the way it's been reared, where it's been reared, um, or it might just be that you want that translation across. And look, you know, you, you talk about being at the heart of communities, the British pub, British beer, local beers 
are synonymous with this. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. It is about making sure that you've got something that is locally developed and locally produced. And that's about, I mean, the French call it terroir, don't they? I mean, it's that sort of what comes from the landscape and gives it that specific uh, reason. But you have to explain that to a customer. You know, the reason that you're going for Welsh lamb is the flavour, particularly if they're coming from salt marshes. The reason that you're going for that particular beer is because it comes from that water, the cheese from that dairy. Um, so it's not going to work for every single product, but it is going to work as a principle about trying to explain provenance for people and trying to explain what, what you're looking at. And there's a very good commercial reason which Simon alluded to, which is we've had really stretched supply chain issues um, and we need to be looking at building back resilience. And, and some of that will be about hyper-local supply. Some of that will be about national supply. Some of that will be about uh, UK wide supply before we look at, at, at importing products. But again, on the import, it's about making sure you've got clear provenance so the customer knows what the standards are to which it is developed. Because the whole only point of doing it is if you've got a USP, you only market that particular bit of bacon as coming from that farm. If it if it adds value, if it gives you the ability to trade up, if it gives you the ability to demonstrate that you're higher quality. And then for some people, you know, if you look at places like Inishir in, in Mid Wales, near McCunfleth, you, you know, they are they make a particular virtue at the very highest end of everything being locally sourced, the minimal number of food miles using local and traditional products. Um, but that's going to be very different from a chain restaurant or a chain pub that is operating still in the heart of their community. But there's ways in which we can make sure that we're explaining that provenance better. Thank you. I 100% I agree. And Simon, I'd, I'd love to hear your views on, on that. Do we do we explain it well enough at the moment? Are we? I mean, it doesn't seem to me like we're really putting as much on menus and, and, and information as we as possibly our consumers want. Well, there are some challenges there, particularly at the moment. I think, uh, you know, one of the best ways of doing this is through staff training and the, and the ability of front of house in particular to be able to tell that story, answer questions, give a bit of flavour to it. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of time working on that. But at the moment, it's really difficult with, uh, with the challenges there are with staffing and, and the frequency of staff turnover. So that's, that's, that's really important. There is a kind of, you can... You know, you've got to find a balance with it as well, um, because I, I feel that you can overwhelm the customer with this, particularly on menus, you know, where it's down to the nth degree of where things came from. And I think that we need to start being a bit more imaginative about the way that we do that. I mean, I, I noticed when I was out in France recently that the use of QR codes, which has happened as a result of COVID and, and you know, um, or changes in ordering generally, but they were also using them to, to uh, display the provenance of particular items on the menu and give the kind of detail that you're really not going to get on a menu because it would be too wordy. So I think there's some opportunities to explore there. People really do want to make those connections. And I think in, in this thing of transparency is really important as well. Because if you're just saying stuff is from a particular farm or whatever it is, well, a lot of the you know, large retailers do that, and there's actually no real. There's no. There's no real. Uh, there's nothing solid about that. Often, those places are just fantasies and fantasy farms. So, customers have a certain degree of cynicism as well. So, you know, you have to work to overcome that. Mm -hmm. You know, just putting that this is local or it's from Wales or whatever isn't telling enough of the story, really. Mm -hmm. So that connection is really important. And just one further point on local, I think that is. There's another way of looking at local as well. It's the closeness of the connection between the people that are serving you the food and the people that have made it. So it might not always be geographically local. I mean, so for instance, the wine that we sell, I, you know, we, we import from the producers direct in France and they're very small and there's only, there's nobody between us and them. Simon, I'm just going to stay with you for a second because I'd love to hear a little bit about an example of where something that has that local or Welsh flavour to it that, that has really worked for you. I, either maybe you, you didn't think it would or it worked way, way better than you thought it would or, or just something something that we can sort of almost hang our hats on to say, look, it, you know, it does work. And here's an example. 
Well, I think there are some extraordinary examples out there in terms of premium end of the market and premium pricing. So there's one or two gins that we sell, for instance, that really are at the top end price wise. Um, they're brilliant products. I mean, they're not just about the branding. I mean, they really are at the top end of, you know, of, of the range as far as their quality is concerned. Um, but I've been amazed by how well some of those sell. Um, I think a lot of that is gifts, you know, people buying it to, to pass on to other people. Um, and, and, you know, but there's also that, just that thing of being in the area and wanting to try what's in the area. So there are some, yeah, I mean, look, the value of it, I think, is undisputed. And, and you know, anyone who's not working with it is daft not to. Um, thank you. And Joby, what about wholesale? Is, is wholesale keeping up? with this leaning towards local idea? Do you think that needs, more needs to be done? Yeah, so I think more needs to be done would be my short answer to, to the main question. There's a lot of work to, to be done for wholesale to keep up to speed with it. In the wholesale world, there's a lot of accreditations that a lot of the smaller producers need, and it's both costly and time consuming to get those accreditations. So. For us as a business, we actually invest money and time in helping the smaller producers to get those accreditations because that gets them in the, in the kind of the right forms to be able to be more widely available. But it is challenging because a lot of the time, as Simon mentioned, the, you know, a lot of these local products come at a premium and at a time when the economy is being squeezed, you've got a demand, but sometimes not enough of a demand to be able to list a lot of products and really open up your local proposition. As a business, it's something we're working really hard on. So we, we launched in Scotland a localization project a few years ago, and we've now got over 300 producers we work with in Scotland. Oh. Wales is very much in the infancy of that piece, but as part of our global ownership, we're absolutely on a mission to really drive localization and something Kate mentioned earlier, and we are getting on board with that, we are looking at localization, both in England, Wales, Scotland, to really try and drive that home, because we know that's what the consumers want. We know that's what the customers want. We also suspect, sadly, and, and Simon talked about menus earlier, there's already enough stuff that we legislated to put on there. We think carbon footprint will end up coming on menus soon. So the more we can do to be ahead of the game and, and, and offering kind of lower food miles on, on our products and having that localization piece, the better it'll, the better place will be to succeed. But there's a lot of work to do. Agreed. And, and Kate, just coming on from Joby's point about food miles and, and sustainability, does hospitality have a responsibility to help customers make those choices? And, 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 and can we? Well, I, I think Joby's hit the nail on the head that at the moment it is the challenge of survival for many hospitality businesses rather than having the ability to, to be able to look ahead and think about the, these bigger issues and, and take corporate responsibility. I think the industry did start to, you saw an awful lot of work ahead of COP26. Compass did a massive amount of investment, um, who were the, the, the caterers who were hosting COP26 to show what could be done and how we could nudge customers along the way. I think you do need to be working with the grain of customer sentiment and opinion. And while we're moving into a cost of living squeeze, some of these issues go less to the fore. If you look back a decade when we had the financial crash or more than a decade, at the time organic was in its infancy and that was seen as where you needed to go. You have a financial crash and a cost of living squeeze and customers suddenly are not willing to pay the premium and are more focused on, on, on sort of value for money. So I think there's a, a, a tension at the moment in looking at these things, but we do need to look at, ahead to them. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think that the, the local and traceability. I think traceability for me is, it, it, it seems to come massively to the forefront during the horse meat scandal that, yes. that we had. And I think that that was a bit where consumers kind of opened their eyes and thought, hang on, just because something it says this on the packet doesn't mean it's, at, it's actually that. So for me, the traceability sort of side of things started then. The interesting thing, which I think all three of you have made the point about, which is, is that this local, whether it's hyper-local or not, is actually a very old school theory. That, that, that's actually kind of where food and drink uh, uh, began. Do you think that in the long term we are, that, that local and traceability are gonna continue to be as important? Do you think that that, as you say, Kate, because of the cost of living crisis might drop off the, the agenda? 
I don't think it'll drop off the agenda. I think it will remain important because people want to know about provenance. People want to know about where the product is, is coming and how it's been treated. I think that during the cost of living crisis, the question comes over whether the consumer is willing to pay a premium for that or is willing to sacrifice something in order to get good quality product at a price that they can afford. But I think it will come back round to the fore. And I think as a hospitality sector, it's about trying to find clever ways of managing that. I mean, if you look at what Rockfish has done, for example, you know, very much local provenance, locally sourced fish from the southwest. But then let's invest in a trailer, let's invest in a canning um, facility, let's get that really good fresh produce into cans and distribute it around the UK and have a, a market for that. Now, to me, that is exactly what Simon was saying. That's local produce that is pre, you know, primary producers supplying through and getting a network out. Um, that's the kind of thing we should be celebrating as well as being a, a local provenance. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, with the current, as you say, cost of living crisis, but also the supply chain and, and actually just looking towards the future of what do we want to feed our kids and our grandkids, you know, knowing where things came from, it is incredibly important. So just, just to finish off then, Simon, could you tell me a little bit what you see the future for the businesses that you're involved in looking like? You know, what, what, what changes do you think we're going to go through short term and long term when it comes to that idea of local and sustainable and provenance and traceability? Well, I think it's very important that we recognize that the economic landscape that we got used to is changing hugely. So actually some of the things that we've been talking about in terms of local being more expensive and organic being more expensive is no longer the case at the moment. So, you know, there are instances during the summer when we're buying tomatoes from a place an hour down the road, which has got, and they're organic and unbelievable quality. We're able to retail them at the same price as mid-priced uh, Tesco's tomatoes for instance. So that, that landscape's changing and it, and, it, and it could change an awful lot more because the instability of the global food system, uh, which you know, means that you know, imports become uh, less reliable and more expensive. So we shouldn't assume that we're gonna be in this environment forever. Um, I, I look at it optimistically. I, I, I want to see businesses like ours and others that are relatively small, but building relationships with suppliers so that you've got you know um, predictable contracts so that you can negotiate prices in advance so that you know what sort of stable markets there are for people so that our producers have those stable markets for their goods um, and i think in that there's an awful lot of resilience and strength and um yeah i i, I mean i i see more welsh on the welsh plate as we go forward brilliant thank you very much and joby what about you what does the future look like for those sort of four areas of focus for, for breaks and, and indeed what you see in wholesale in general? Yeah, so um, we, we typically look at sort of uh, the US market to influence a lot of our decisions as a business. We've seen a real focus on localization and sustainability in the US. We absolutely think that's going to become really, really prevalent over here. Um, notwithstanding, we've got a few challenges to get through before that really comes to the fore properly. But we absolutely think that sustainability, local locality, the traceability of products is going to be hugely important. More legislation is going to come in. So we have to make sure we're really disciplined at, at kind of following the rules and regulations that we have to operate within. But I think the next generation of consumers as they're coming through, they have um, less money to spend. But when they spend, they tend to go out and premiumize. And we have to make sure we deliver that. And I think bringing on or bringing to the fore the the, the locality, the Welshness of products that's available. And there is a plethora of brilliant brands out there that absolutely can do a fantastic job for people. I think that's really important for us. And what we've got to do over the next sort of couple of years is slowly seed in products based on um, the ability to manage that with consumers and spend being tightened, ready to really unleash it as we get out the other side of the, of the squeeze. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And, and, and Kate, the, the plate of UKH and yourself is, is always full, whether it's locally full or not. Um, what are UKH thinking about the future for those sort of four areas of sustainability and provenance and, and locality, et cetera? Well, I, I think all of those are going to be ever more relevant to the new consumers, the younger consumers that we've got coming through. As Joby says, notwithstanding the cost of living squeeze, you're still going to have those principles and sustainability is going to be really at the heart of what we need to do after the three years that we've had 
trying to build back some resilience into all of the, the supply chain, uh, the producers, the, the small independent retailers, the small independent hospitality businesses, the national chains, and the wholesalers that, that get us our food from farm to fork, we're going to need to work on building back sustainability across that piece. And part of that is about growing some of these great kitchen producers to be national brands and, and to be the success story so that we can export it. And it's great to be recording this on the weekend when we finally can export Welsh lamb to America for the first time in 20 years and give the world a taste of our brilliant quality food. That to me is where local adds real value. We start with a local badge, a badge of pride, whether it's Yorkshire cheese or Northumberland fish or Welsh lamb. Um, she says as one person who's allergic to lamb. But, you know, we then take it not just across Marks and Spencer's estate in the UK, we send it to the restaurants in New York and we give them a taste of the best lamb in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And I think that, that global domination is the perfect place for us to end this webinar on local. Joby, Kate, Simon, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to eating some of that, eating and drinking some of that amazing local produce that we've been talking about.